Hi, thank you for having me on, on this program. Um, my name is uh, Fadel Kaboub. Uh, I teach economics at Denison University in Ohio, and I'm also the president of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. Uh, today, I want to talk about um, the concept of economic and monetary sovereignty, uh, and I'm engaging in this conversation uh, with an MMT lens, uh, applying um, modern monetary theory uh, to talk about the uh, realm of possibilities for developing countries uh, in general, for uh, countries uh, in Latin America in, in particular. Uh, so to begin this, this conversation, what I want you to think about is the idea that um, monetary sovereignty is, uh, is in fact a spectrum. There are different degrees of monetary sovereignty. Um, so the way I'm going to define monetary sovereignty is, is the following. Think of a country that can issue its own currency. Uh, most countries can do that. Number two, a country that can um, tax the population in the same national currency. Uh, most countries can also do that. Uh, number three, a country that avoids completely uh, issuing debt, issuing bonds denominated in foreign currencies. In other words, um, you want to avoid having any external debt uh, as much as possible. Number four, uh, think of a country that follows a flexible exchange rate regime as opposed to a fixed exchange rate regime. So if you, if you have these four components, um, you have a very high degree of monetary sovereignty. Think of countries like the United States, uh, Canada, Japan, the UK, and, and so on. Um, but it, if, you, if you don't have these four components in place, it doesn't mean you have zero monetary sovereignty. You have some degree of monetary sovereignty. And the level of your monetary sovereignty depends on how much external debt you have, for example. Uh, it also depends on how badly you need to fix your exchange rate to the dollar or to the euro or to the British pound or, or to some other uh, foreign currency or commodity like gold. Uh, in other words, can your economy withstand an external shock, um, an exchange rate depreciation without your government having to sacrifice public health or public education or national priorities like access to education and things like that? So the concept of monetary sovereignty allows us to think of the degree of economic independence and, uh, and self-determination in, in public policy. So now that we have this uh, concept, think of the spectrum of monetary sovereignty where on the one side you have countries like the United States, Japan, and Canada, and so on. And then on the other extreme end of monetary sovereignty, you have countries that completely gave up their monetary sovereignty, like the member countries of the Eurozone who gave up uh, their monetary sovereignty. Uh, think of a country like Ecuador that dollarized its economy and doesn't even have the capacity to issue its own national currency. But most countries that um, we're thinking about in terms of economic development are somewhere in between, in the middle of that spectrum, depending on how much external debt they have. So it turns out one of the key drivers of weakening your economic sovereignty is external debt. And when you dig deeper into the root causes of uh, external debt, you realize that it has to do with three core components. And here I'm generalizing for most developing countries. Uh, these components are, number one, the lack of food sovereignty. Uh, in other words, countries that end up importing a lot of their food. Number two, a lack of uh, energy sovereignty, countries that end up importing a lot of fossil fuels in particular to fuel their economy. Um, and this is also true, by the way, for countries who are net exporters, of, who are exporters of oil, uh, oil and gas, because they end up exporting crude oil and then importing refined petrochemicals like gasoline and kerosene and petrochemicals of different kinds. Um, and number three, uh, which is related to this oil, crude oil versus refined uh, petroleum products, Number three, it's a deficiency in the industrial system where you have a country that typically exports low value added content and imports high value added content. In other words, you have a country that um, you know, on, the, on the surface of it looks like uh, it's exporting cars or it's exporting computers or exporting industrial machinery. But in reality, uh, 
it's actually importing all the technology, all the components, the intermediate goods, and is simply playing the role of an assembly line for the global supply chain. And in that sense, the contribution of that country is simply the cheap labor um, that goes into assembling the final product. Uh, so you're importing high value added content, you're exporting low value added content, you're losing uh, in, in the long term. So if you take these three components, food sovereignty, energy sovereignty, and, and this value added mismatch, you have a constant pressure um, in, the, in the form of uh, trade deficits. And that materializes eventually in a depreciation of the currency relative to the dollar. And that depreciation, if left unchecked, will immediately you know, hurt the consumers at the local level because now your food imports, your energy imports, your imports of basic necessities like medicine uh, will become more expensive for your domestic consumers. In other words, you're importing inflation. In other words, you're gonna have lots of social unrest, possibly uh, uprisings uh, when people can't afford food, can't afford healthcare, can't afford transportation or heating or cooling their, their homes. So in order to avoid this social unrest driven by this imported inflation, most countries, typically their central banks, will intervene to artificially fix the exchange rate. And the way they do this is by borrowing US dollars to help sustain the exchange rate. So this constant trap of trade deficits related to food sovereignty, energy sovereignty, and, and the value added mismatch puts constant pressure every year on the central bank to borrow more in US dollars. And now in order to pay off that external debt, you have to completely redirect your economic strategy to earn as many dollars as possible every year. So you do that with tourism, you do that with foreign direct investment, you do that with trying to bring foreign investors into your stock market, you do that by um, <clears throat> trying to accelerate your exports. Um, you do that by, um, you know, uh, attracting as many foreign investors as possible. So now your economic policy strategy is focused on prioritizing the needs of tourists, the needs of foreign investors, the needs of uh, multinational corporations in order to raise the dollar revenues to do it. And it turns out that those strategies are actually a trap. Uh, and I'm going to go over these you know, five key strategies that most people usually think of in terms of economic development. Number one, let's start with tourism. The problem with tourism is, yes, it brings in dollar revenues, but you have to, you know, you end up importing more food to feed the tourist. You end up importing more energy to transport and heat and cool the hotels for them and, and, and transport, um, you know, the food and equipments needed for the tourism industry. So you end up actually losing even more from tourism, especially if you specialize in cheap tourism, right? You're racing to the bottom because you're competing with 120 other countries that also have a beautiful country with beautiful weather and so on. So the tourism strategy, you know, if you include the real cost of tourism, is actually not a good strategy. It's actually a trap. Number two, you know, foreign direct investment, you end up you know, racing to the bottom, lowering your standards for health and environment and labor standards to attract multinational corporations who are coming in essentially to take advantage of the assembly line status that you've established in your industrial system. So you end up importing all the components, producing whatever they produce with low value added content, and then the profits from the industries will be repatriated anyway. It's not going to be reinvested in the country. So FDI is also a trap uh, in, in this sense. Uh, Export-oriented uh, growth, uh, trying to you know, encourage as much of your uh, industries to export as much as possible, and that includes extractive industries for, for mining, for example. It turns out if you specialize in low-value-added content, those export industries will import all the technology, all the capital, all the intermediate goods, and end up exporting low-value-added content anyway. But in the process of encouraging exports, you end up subsidizing their electricity bills. You end up subsidizing their labor costs. You end up subsidizing entire industries 
that are not actually helping you to reclaim more of your economic sovereignty. Um, uh, in terms of the, you know, the, the focus on, um, uh, you know, privatizing state-owned enterprises, because the idea is you sell the telecom company, you get millions of dollars to help you pay off, you know, some of your debt. Uh, it does work as a band-aid solution, but once you privatize the telecom, the water company, the electric company, you can't privatize them again. You spend the money in two or three years, and then you're back to square one. That's not a, a long-term strategy. Uh, the idea of attracting foreign investors to your financial markets, you end up manipulating your interest rates, your monetary policy in order to attract um, uh, foreign investors to your stock market. Um, who's going to come to your stock market as opposed to going to London or Tokyo or, or New York where, where they have you know, higher standards for regulation, maybe even higher taxes. So you end up attracting them by lowering the, the tax rate um, eliminating capital controls and you know targeting inflation, which is what they what they want, uh, you end up essentially attracting speculators primarily. Uh, you know, real long-term investors are not interested in um, uh, in in economies that manipulate their exchange rates and manipulate their uh, interest rates for for short-term um, uh, economic boost. So you end up with a financial crisis as soon as those speculators leave your economy. So what we're talking about here is developing an economic development strategy that moves away from these five strategies that we've tried for decades in, in most countries in the global south, Latin America in, in particular. And as they say, if, if you're in a deep hole, um, the first thing you do is you stop digging. You stop using the same old strategies and you design a new strategy to move out of this uh, situation. And, and I'd like to suggest that MMT provides a framework that allows us to do this. So there's no way we're going to address the root causes of this lack of monetary sovereignty, of the lack of um, uh, economic sovereignty, unless we address the issue of food sovereignty, the issue of energy sovereignty, and the issue of low value added content of industrial production. Um, and we're not gonna do this unless we invest in uh, mobilizing domestic resources to invest in sustainable agriculture, to reach a level of self-sufficiency, uh, to invest in renewable energy production domestically uh, in order to, number one, fight climate change but and improve quality of life, but number two, acquire a, a level of energy sovereignty that allows you to uh, set your priorities uh, and, and stop the bleeding, so to speak, from your trade deficit pressure point that's leading to this you know, um, importing of inflation uh, component, uh, the pass-through effect of inflation. And then number three, in terms of you know, claim, climbing up the ladder, so to speak, of the value added chain, you're not gonna be able to do that unless you invest in education and especially in technical and vocational training and have an industrial strategy that, that's actually built on and designed um, to uh, move your industrial production capacity from low value added content to high value added content. Ideally, you'll do that in partnership with universities, with commitment to uh, fund research and development in strategic areas that allow you to acquire a stronger degree of economic resilience to these external shocks. So one way to think about, you know, how do we fund these things? Because that's the, usually the question that, that we hear, where does the money come from? Well, the conventional thinking about the capacity of the government to spend is usually usually tells us that government spending is limited by its taxing capacity and by its borrowing capacity. So think of this being the fiscal policy space. What MMT is saying, what modern monetary theory is saying, is that government spending is not limited by tax revenues or by um, uh, uh, borrowing capacity. In fact, the fiscal policy space is much larger than that, but it's not unlimited. There is a limit to it. So the real limit to government spending capacity or the fiscal policy space uh, is the risk of inflation. And the risk of inflation is determined by two key factors. The first one is 
the availability of productive capacity. In other words, if we run out of equipment and skilled labor and materials to produce more stuff, then we'll start seeing you know, upward pressure on prices and inflation risk. The good news about this risk of inflation is that with industrial planning and industrial strategy and investment in strategic areas, we can start to increase the availability of productive capacity. We can train more doctors. We can train more nurses. We can build more equipment and, and materials. So you have to plan ahead uh, for, for those kinds of limits. The second source of inflation, which is extremely important, is that inflation can happen also because of too much abusive market power where you have corporate interests in key areas of the economy. It could be healthcare, it could be um, uh, you know, in the energy sector, it could be in the transportation sector or the real estate sector, where you have key players who can raise prices because they can, or in other words, because we let them, because state government regulators allow them to get away with raising prices and abusing their market power uh, and, um, and, and the economy. And that kind of inflation, we're not going to eliminate it by spending less, by applying, uh, implementing austerity policies. That kind of inflation, you get rid of it by taxing and regulating their market power out of existence. In other words, you make those markets more competitive. Uh, in other words, you reclaim the democratic process where elected officials who are the regulators can actually use the power of the state to regulate uh, market conditions in order to increase the fiscal capacity of the, of the government. So here when we say we tax and regulate corporations, we're not taxing them in order to generate revenues for the state to fund its activities. So MMT decouples the spending from taxing uh, both are important functions, but they're not necessarily linked. So we spend on the national priorities to improve um, our capacity to produce. We invest in strategic areas like health and education and infrastructure and renewable energy and food sustainability and so on. And then we tax to decarbonize the economy. So tax fossil fuel companies and regulate them, not because we need their money or their permission to transition to a clean economy, but because we want to decarbonize the economy. You tax the oligarchs, not because we need their money or their permission to fund education, but because we want to protect democracy from oligarchy. You want to reduce their power and influence in politics. And that's an important function of taxation. Uh, you tax you know, financial institutions that have abusive market power, um, not because we need their money or their permission to fund public health, but because we want to reduce their power and influence in the economy, because we want to reduce inequality. So there's all kinds of reasons why we should tax on the top end of, uh, of the income groups, but none of it is related to funding public education or health or infrastructure. So in order for us to think strategically about building economic resilience and economic sovereignty and monetary sovereignty, number one, we have to identify the root causes of the lack of economic sovereignty. Number two, we have to design um, public policies that help us build capacity and build resilience in those strategic areas. And number three, we have to recognize that there is a direct connection between the lack of fiscal policy space and the level of corruption, the level of, the level of abuse of market power, where you have to elect public officials who are ready to take the challenge of regulating potentially people who contribute to their campaigns, people who contribute to their political parties. And this is the essence of corruption, uh, even though and most of the time it's not designated as corruption, it's designated as campaign contributions. But you have to recognize that politicians are not gonna bite the hand that feeds them. Uh, in this case, it will be you know, large corporate interests from energy companies and, and so on. And, and finally, I'll close by saying that in, in developing countries in particular, you have, um, and it is varies from country to country, you have situations where um, the government gives exclusive uh, import licenses 
to individuals to bring in strategic resources like um, medical equipment or medicine or, or key food items. And those individuals accumulate large political capital and economic capital that makes them, put them in a position where they block the development of any domestic industry that challenges their economic interest. And they'll use political leverage, obviously, to do so. Uh, so again, um, if we aspire to live in a democratic uh, society, then we have to have a political system that's willing to um, tame down the economic interest and political interest of you know, state-created monopolies, essentially, through the licensing system. Number two, you have also exporters who have exclusive privileges in developing countries because this, the, the last 30 or 40 years where we have this obsession with exports and encouraging exports, exporters also develop a huge uh, economic and political weight in most developing countries where they're giving exclusive um, you know, privileges for you know, having you know, offshore bank accounts and foreign currency bank accounts. Um, because they're bringing the export revenues, they're bringing U.S. dollars to the economy. So that's also another, um, you know, extractive industry, you can think of it this way, uh, that needs to be tamed because they will also block the development of domestic, um, um, domestic production systems that help the country develop um, acquire larger productive capacity for internal economic development. So you have these existing realities that have to be challenged. So MMT uh, essentially provides this analytical lens that allows us to identify the weaknesses, develop new strategies, not repeating the same strategies, and highlights the real political obstacles uh, that that we face because it's it's one thing to to say that you know there's corruption in the system kind of in the vague uh, kind of label of corruption. Uh, it's another thing to say there's corruption and kind of the small petty you know corruption type of thing. All of these are important, but these are structural, economic and political you know foundations that are fundamentally corrupt and need to be undone. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A session. And, and thanks again to my colleague for providing the translation.